bit today about uh, fermented foods in particular in Scotland and their relationship to food waste, um, but sowens, which is an oat porridge, is what I'm particularly going to focus on. So I learned about sowens while I was researching for my next book um, that you just mentioned, Culture Begins Here. And um, I became so intrigued by it that I eventually built a whole class around it and obviously included it in the book and everything. Um, because they're just such an interesting food to me. So my goal with this talk isn't to give you a complete exhaustive history of food waste or fermentation in Scotland, um, but rather to highlight a few interesting points, both about sowens and about some other foods, um, and close with a few thoughts about kind of what we can learn from all of this. So the main takeaways I want you to leave with are um, that sowens are delicious, first of all, um, and a beautiful example of our ancestors' creativity in kind of squeezing every bit of available nutrition and usability out of their food. Um, and that, uh, also that people for much of history, of course, have not had access to supermarkets and just-in-time supply chains. And even when we do, those sometimes break down, as many of us saw um, this spring. Um, and so it was very critical for people to use what they could when they had it. And so um, a lot of the stuff we're talking about exists with context. So um, also, finally, uh, I want us to think about our own waste, uh, our own food waste too. This is a, you know, a food history talk, but the history applies to the present. Um, we throw away roughly one quarter of the fresh produce that, um, that we consume. So it would do us well to, uh, to reduce that amount a bit. So, when I think of Scottish food and beverage, I think of foods that are made by people who are mindfully using up what's around them and they're using them to delicious effect. So this can be cultivated crops like oats or wild ones uh, like heather. And of course, we'll go into a few examples. And when we think about how people have historically engaged with food security, one thing I really want uh, to point out is that it's critical to not just consider what people were cultivating, um, and they were, of course, growing and storing that, but they were also wild harvesting all these plants. Um, and that was a big way they supported food security. So in Scotland, this would include things like uh, wild greens like dandelion, nuts, berries, mushrooms, you know, kind of the whole suite of stuff that you can harvest. And um, since our edible plants are sometimes also used medicinally, there's, of course, an overlap between the plants we would eat and then the plants we would use to heal ourselves um, or for other purposes like say for divination. Um, mugwort is one example that has been used um, to bitter beverages to flavor say beers and other fermented beverages like that. Um, but it's also been uh, put to a number of other effects. It's used uh, for women's reproductive health. Um, if you put a sprig under your pillow, it's said to help you with dreams, um, sometimes prophetic ones. So that's an example of taking a wild plant from the land and using it not only for food security, but for, um, for your health as well. And when we're thinking about wild plants in relation to food waste, um, I like to think through kind of the lens that Pascal Bowder uses, if you're familiar with, uh, with his work. So if you, if you haven't seen it before, his thoughts on wild invasives and food waste are very good. Um, he's based in California, but his perspective could apply anywhere. And basically what he says is that we have all of these invasive plants around us that are edible. Um, oh yes, um, for everyone other than the speaker, please make sure your microphone is muted. Thank you, uh, thank you Matt. Um, so, um, we have all these invasive plants around us that are edible. Um, so here, for example, in Atlanta and in the US, we have garlic mustard, which is a very, very invasive plant. Um, and so people wreak environmental havoc, spraying these things, mowing them, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And instead, when we view them through the lens of food waste, what we see is this, you know, these whole landscapes of invasive plants that could be harnessed to address food insecurity rather than addressing, um, or rather than just seeing them as an aesthetic nuisance. And so when we think about people harvesting wild food, that's more in keeping with the way that um, people historically in Scotland would have gathered this food and would have, um, would have fermented it, dried it, whatever else um, to preserve it. So, um, so another example of using wild food here is heather honey, um, which has been uh, brewed into mead for thousands of years 
in, um, in Scotland. And so heather honey is particularly thick and protein rich compared to other honeys. It's very hard to get out of the comb. Um, and as a result, when brewing the mead, um, the comb full of, um, as Stephen Herod Buner says, you know, angry bees, propolis, pollen, royal jelly, honey, and wax would all just end up in the fermentation vat. Um, and this is, this is also another example in a way of waste because we are, um, when we're fermenting all that stuff off the comb, we're also then preserving that, um, that comb, we're cleaning it off so that then you can use that wax for other purposes. That's what I do every time I get honeycombs. Um, so because of this, the final product was quite nutrient rich. Um, and so as uh, Stephen Herod Buner argues, uh, it's nutrient density was part of the reason he says that the warriors in ancient Scotland, um, when they were encountered by the war, uh, by the Romans, sorry, were um, said to be particularly strong and fierce and honestly kind of scary. So um, it was also the source of two similar ancient sayings um, in Scotland, mead drinkers have as much strength as meat eaters um, and the German um, mead is as strengthening as meat. And so you see that these fermented foods that are using up what's in the environment around folks are also actually very nourishing for them as well. We would also see meads that would have um, hybrid and, of honey and other sugar sources like barley, um, but the early ones that we know about about 4,000 years ago um, from the Picts and the Celts were brewed with heather honey only without the addition of grains. Um, and so to my earlier point in the case of heather mead, like this isn't just a fun drink, it's also a nutritional source. Beer and mead have um, long offered populations in the British Isles, around the British Isles, um, needed calories as a supplement to those found in food, <coughs> particularly at moments of, um, of scarcity. And so this is another way to kind of make sure that you are getting, getting that nutrition, guarding yourself against hunger um, and using up what's around you too. Um, you can use, you know, you can use the mash from beer, for example, to feed livestock, um, bake it into bread, all kinds of stuff. So Scots fermented and ferment a number of other foods too. Sauerkraut, for example, um, isn't obviously as huge as in Germany, but it exists in Scotland. Um, other pickled vegetables, stuff like that. However, these of course are not unique to Scotland. Um, and so when I think of a purely Scottish ferment, my mind goes to Sowens, which was once a popular food. Um, it's now somewhat fallen out of favor. You can still find it, um, but I do hope it sees a resurgence. And so I refer to this dish as a case of making taste from waste um, because it's a creative example of using up uh, food scraps to create a new product. So we do see examples of fermented oats elsewhere in Celtic Europe. Um, there's fermented overnight uh, oats from Britannia, for example, but nowhere else have I found, um, found the starches left on the oat holes themselves. And of course, we'll get into that more in a moment. Um, for that to be used for a sour porridge. That is kind of the uniquely Scottish twist on this. Um, so that process is unique to the country, um, but it also, you know, it, it speaks to me of Scottish cuisine, of course, because it uses the oat, which is so central to Scottish cuisine. Um, and though oats are not native to Scotland, they were introduced by the Romans as one of the few introduced crops that could thrive um, in Scotland's cool, wet climate. And so, it became very central to um, to people's diets, and you know the the climate being inhospitable to a lot of crops is another reason why having these sorts of foods that really used everything that you could was so important. So back to Sowens. Um, Sowens is a sour porridge. It's made from soaking and fermenting oat hulls after thrashing. Um, thrashing, sorry. Um, so rather than um, separating out the holes, um, millers would sift, um, sift the sieves, this is the hard outer shells, out, hard outer holes um, from the oats while they were grinding them um, and reserve them and ferment them. And the starches that were left on them would both feed, uh, feed the microbes that would ferment them and then um, also form the food itself. They would separate from the holes and uh, form the food. So we have sowens, which is a porridge made from that, and we have swats, which is the fermenting liquid that uh, comes from that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the process in a moment, um, but I wanna go through some of the places we've seen them very quickly first. So first known written appearance is in 1693. George Ridpath describes them as a good food for body and soul, 
but it's important to note here that RIDPAS simply simply describes them as good for body and soul, doesn't define them, doesn't mention them as like, maybe this thing you should try, like it's kind of just like, oh, this food we all know, you should, you know, it's good for you, basically. So that tells us that this food had been around for a while and that, um, that by this point it was central enough to the culture that you could, you know, you could have it in, um, in your work and not have to define what it was for your readers. Um, as a side note, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary uh, says the first known use of sow-ins as a word was in 1582, but they sadly do not pri provide any sources, so there's no way to fact check that one. Um, but perhaps perhaps earlier than Ridpath, possible, I guess. Um, but one thing I found interesting was in 1736, uh, the records of Barony of Kintour dictate that tenant farmers uh, must sufficiently sift their sieves from their oats, um, noting that if they tried to keep back any of the sieves for themselves, they would then have to forfeit double the weight of both sieves and oats um, to, uh, to the barony. So apparently many of the crofters had tried to hold back some of these sieves and, um, and the barony, barony of Kintor was not pleased. And so um, they were trying to crack down on that. This indicates, of course, the value of sieves as a product um, that people are trying to hang on to them. Um, and by extension, the value of sowins, a product of SIDS as well. So SIDS, again, are those hard outer oat holes. Um, and so sowins was seen as a critical food for maintaining health. Even a century after Ridpath, they were one of the foods given to patients at the Dundee Royal Infirmary in 1798. They also appear in the 1812 health, Healthful Cookery book as a good food for folks who are ill and for young children. Um, by 1871, sow-in scones were still very popular in the north of the country and uh, sow-ins as well. Um, but we see less mention of them th through the 20th century. Anecdotally, I've spoken with a number of people who can recall having them or remember them being around in the 50s and 60s, but I haven't heard as many people talk about that um, more recently. So. They do still exist, though. They haven't gone away entirely. Um, so, for example, Sowen's Night in Aberdeen that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's my understanding they're no longer widely eaten and are more common to find in the highlands um, than in countrywide. So um, the Sowen's making process itself um, results in several different products. So again, we have those hard outer holes um, that are separated from the oat. Um, when we when we mill them, and so this results in the pieces of whole themselves, um, and sowins and swats. And so what you basically do is you take those hard outer holes, you put them in a fermentation vessel, you add water, and you let them sit there until sour. And once you do that, the holes will separate from the starch, and so the holes will be um, will you know float up, or you can you know strain them off. Um, and you scrape those out and you can use them for livestock feed, for example. Um, Sowins themselves is the, the actual starch. It will gather on the bottom of your fermentation vessel and that you will, um, you will use for porridge, scones, um, whatever else as a beverage sometimes. Um, and swats is that fermentation liquid. So you've got your, your starch settled at the bottom of a jar or whatever vessel and then the liquid over top of it. And so what you do is you gently pour this liquid off, you drink the liquid and um, you use this starch in the bottom as, as a porridge. And this is of course, in addition to the oats themselves. So sowins were uh, fermented in a container called a sowins bowie, um, kind of like a narrow wooden tub that looked like a little barrel. Um, they would ferment usually for one to two weeks. Um, and yeah, they were typically enjoyed as a porridge. Um, sometimes the exact application would depend where you were and you know, your personal preferences, of course. Um, but drinking sowins, um, so that, that fermented starchy liquid again, or that uh, porridgey kind of liquid um, would be warmed and sweetened with treacle. And that was a, um, a winter holiday treat um, in Aberdeen. Christmas Eve is also called sowins night. Um, in an ode to this as a beverage. Um, in some place, they're also called Yule Sowens. And so they're very associated with wintertime holidays. Um, and so Yule Sowens were a social experience as well. Um, if I, I read one, um, one 
particular source that said that if you turned down an invitation to have Yule Sowins after you went to bed, there was a chance that your house might be selected for sowing, which is basically where people would come over and take the leftover sowins and and whitewash your windows and doors with them. And since these are starchy, you know, oat oat starch, I mean, that had to be very fun to get off of your house. Um, they were also part of Samhain or Halloween. Um, they're mentioned in Robert Burns' poem, Halloween. Um, and they would also be used um, sometimes people, you know, just like we see with like Colcannon in Ireland and other things like where people will sometimes put little charms and other things in there so that when you, whatever object you find is um, supposed to predict your, you know, the next year or whatever, um, that they would do that with stones as well. So example, you they would put like coins and rings and stuff in there. And if you found a ring, it meant like you were getting married. If you found a coin, it mean you would get wealth, stuff like that. Um, and so we do see oat based porridges across uh, Europe. Um, there's flummery um, used to refer to a fermented oatmeal. It later came to refer to a custard based dessert. Um, Robert Ferguson defined sowins as a type of flummery. Um, though I argue that the, um, the differences in their production processes um, and the particular fact that sowins is a part of using up the waste of this other, the waste product from making this other food makes it a distinct thing. So what can we learn by looking at Scottish ferments and, um, and thinking about food waste within that context? So Scottish cu cuisine is one of ingenuity and resilience. Um, we're using up available resources as we see in Sowens um, and using them completely. Um, this isn't to say that everything that everybody eats is just like fermented porridges. Of course, there's a whole range of things, but um, but this is one example of you know using up waste. So fermentation was a part of this practice and um, and was a very creative part, I would argue. Um, so this um, it would. And Oh, sorry. There's somebody else's microphone on. Um, so, Scottish cuisine is also um, tied to the land, as we said, so, to place and identity. Um, so, Scotch whiskey and heather mead, for example, are foods that couldn't be made identically elsewhere because they rely on their geography and its um, flora and fauna uh, to taste and function as they do. So, to me, this kind of relates to the concept of terroir, which I know we apply to wine, but can be you know, applied to other very place-based things. Um, and when we're thinking about food waste and we're thinking about that, you know, you can come up with like all of these foods that use, you know, as we talked about invasive plants, for example, um, and you know, the way that they taste addresses the way that the landscape has been changed over time. So, um, you know, oats, we, we see a lot of ingredients that are, you know, pretty affordable and um, like oats and, and cabbage um, used for our ferments, um, but they're used to really affect uh, delicious effect. So um, that sour tang from them also kind of helps through, helps to cut through the richness of other foods and um, balance, you know, create balance and flavor and nutrition. Of course, fermentation helps us use up all kinds of scraps like you can use up apple scraps um, for vinegar, for example, you can use up all kinds of things. So um, that helps us diversify our diets, not only in terms of flavor, but as in terms of nutrition as well. And when you're fermenting them, as opposed to, um, you know, just say like eating, a, eating it fresh, you're able to keep it longer, which is important. So Make sure I don't have any other important notes to tell you. I think that's it. So um, as I said at the beginning of this talk, I really hope that you, you know, took away some new exciting points about sow-ins, but also that you're inspired to re-envision your own relationship with food scraps, um, using all the parts of your food to their fullest extent, um, and, uh, and kind of drawing some inspiration from some of these historical examples to inform how you are cooking your own food today. So. Thank you for listening to my talk. I'm going to type my um, my contact information in the um, chat box so that if you want to reach out, if you have questions after the talk, you can do so. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.
Thanks so much, Julia. That was really interesting. I think, you know, someone's has, I didn't realize the long history of someone's and then particularly, I'm just thinking about how we could use this really interesting idea of food waste in modern context. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in the, in the chat, but thank you so much. I'm sure everybody is quietly, you know, clapping in their muted squares, <laughs> basically. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, next, we'll go on to Cesar Rivarito Guia. Um, and Cesar um, is a senior econ economist, um, economist, sorry, um, food marketing research team leader and reader in food supply chain economics with Scotland's Rural College in Edinburgh. He has a PhD in agriculture and resource economics from the University of California, Davis, with specialization in industrial organization, trade, and eco econom sorry, econometrics. His research interests cover um, agri-food supply chains, um, such as agriculture, production, and distribution, um, and their um, environment, including issues such as production, marketing, food supply analysis, food security, market structure, trade, and demand analysis. Um, tonight, he'll be um, delivering his paper entitled, An Evolution of the Consumption of Sweet Discretionary Products in Scotland. So over to you, um, Cesar. Uh -huh. Many, many thanks, Kelly, uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So you, uh, can you see well the, the, the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, This is basically uh, the possibility to use some data that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture made uh, available on, on food. Um, and it's also related to another project uh, with the Scottish government on, this, on discretionary products, which you will see the, what they are. Um, Scotland has a reputation for its sweet tooth within the United Kingdom. I mean, some of the indications that, that you have is that 40% of Scots, according to a survey, uh, admitted that they eat candy at least once a day in comparison with 30% in the case of uh, England and Wales. Uh, according to Marks and Spencer, which is a... Um, a supermarket chain, if you're not uh, British, claims that it's one of the sweetest streets, which is a sticky toffee pudding, sells much better in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. Uh, also, I have to mention the, the, the Scottish, a Scottish fish and chips shop. I mean, I believe it's in Stonehaven. Uh, invented the famous deep fried Mars bar. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is a culinary uh, great, but anyway, uh, but anyway, it is spread rapidly across the country. Others blamed actually the, the, the sweet tooth to the British Empire and the fact that sugar was shipped from the Caribbean to Scotland for granulation. And much of it ended up in refineries around Glasgow. Apologies for the noises. Uh, uh, Greenock, which is not, not far from Glasgow, actually on the river on the river Clyde, was named Sugaropolis. And it has plenty of impact on, on the culture of the of the place. Um, as I said, the, the motivation was related to, to uh, a project that we had uh, uh, this year with, with the Scottish government. And it has to do with I mean, something that is well known, poor diets and being overweight have negative impact on health and well-being. And to address this, the Scottish government published its diet and healthy weight delivery plan in July 2018, which include actions to change the, the food environment and how to improve it. 
I mean, they, they provided several measures as part of that. And one of the keys of the, of the plan was to reduce the consumption of the so-called discretionary food products, which are those high in fat, sugar, and or salt, and they are high in calories and low in nutritional value. You're going to get disappointed when you hear where, which these products are. I mean, examples are confectionery, cakes, biscuits, pastries, crisps and savory snacks, regular soft drinks, puddings and desserts, ice cream and edible ices. So it's, it's very Christmas. Um, here we're going to concentrate only on the sugary discretionary products and some of them actually. Uh, before we go to the historical part, let me bring you on the, the current situation. This is based on a report uh, in 2020 by the Food Standard Scotland. And I have reproduced some, some, some of the paragraphs that are more relevant here. Uh, they analyzed the top 20 food and drink categories contributing to the purchase of uh, to total cal cal calories, fat, saturated fats, sugar, and sodium in Scotland. And discretionary foods, the, the ones that I mentioned, I mean, contribute 25% of the calories, 26% of fat, 28% of saturated fat, 40% of total sugar and 11% of sodium in, 19, in 2018. I mean, except the case of soft drink, just in case you don't know, uh, there was a, a tax to soft drinks in, in the UK. I mean, the, in the other cases, there's been little improvement in terms of, uh, I mean, the contribution, I mean, the reductions in the contribution of the of this discretionary food product. Uh, particularly, they contribute a lot in terms of sugar. Now, doing the research found this, this citation, it comes from a report of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food from 1955 and refers to the situation in 1953. Uh, this, these are two paragraphs from, from the report of the main 28 main food groups analyzed in table 47, which is, refers to Scotland. Nine show differences in consumption of 30% or more between the average for Scotland and for Great Britain. Uh, at the head of the list with an average consumption nearly 50% higher than that of Great Britain appear cakes, including fruit bread and pastries. Buns, scones, tea cakes together by far make the, the, the greatest contribution and biscuits follow with 30% more than the, than the average of uh, Great Britain. On the other hand, you have flour which appears to be 60% of the average great, uh, of, for Great Britain. And the, and the report suggests that home baking was not much practiced in the Scottish area survey, which, which is interesting because this is a fact that you can find in the history of food in Scotland in the 19th century. And at the time it was related basically to, 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 to the lack of ovens if I remember well. Uh, then you also have, uh, apologies for the noise, uh, preserves, which uh, in the case of Scotland are 23% more than the, than, than the average from Great Britain. Uh, I mean, back to the future, this, this series that you see, and I always going to use red for UK or Great Britain and blue for Scotland. Um, these are the most recent data uh, from, from a publication by the Minister of Agriculture, DEFRA, uh, called Family Food. And 
despite what was mentioned in the 1950s, you, you can see that actually the Scotland appears below average in the case of cakes, buns, and pastries. I mean, they are 11% below. In the case of sweet biscuits, they are slightly 6% higher in Scotland in comparison to what was in the 1950s. And fruit, uh, I mean, jams and fruit curds, I mean, preserves, they, they are slightly, uh, well, 19.3% higher in Scotland than in, in, in the UK, which actually is not that far from the 23% that used to be in, in 1953. So the purpose of all these, I mean, one of the motivations comes from, from these uh, citations of, of Campbell in his 1960s, he said on dieting in Scotland, an example of regional variation, where actually he says that a separate study of Scottish diet must be restricted to the period from the mid 18th century until 1914, before the First World War. Uh, before this century, reliable information on diet is sparse, and after 1914, the difference are just as slight in Great Britain. Uh, so basically the, the purpose of the, uh, this article, I mean, the, the, uh, this work is just the recently disclosed data from the National Food Survey collection to bridge the 1950s to the present and see that evolution because there seemed to be a, a, a change over time on the uh, on, on the purchasing patterns in, in Scotland. Uh, so we see the, the quantities purchases, the sweet discretionary products in Scotland, and then the effect on the sweet discretionary, the share of sweet discretionary food on the total food expenditure. Um, let me just briefly say something about the, uh, this data set. What you have there is the report, the domestic food consumption and expenditure of 1955 that I was referring. Uh, it was this, the data was disclosed at the end of 2016, and the National Food Survey was established in 1940, I mean, basically to, to provide information about the nutrition of the urban working class in 1950. It went to cover Great Britain because of the, the, uh, I mean, they, they, they found far more useful to do the survey. And 1994, the survey extended to cover also eating out, which was very good because before it was only for supplies at home. And since 1996, I mean, it was included uh, the household food part for, for Northern Ireland. So let's go to the, to see the breach in the series over time. And let's go with the, the most basic thing, which is not, not uh, is sugar. And as you see, uh, two things called, one is on, in terms of sugar, basically the, the, the series go very close but there's quite a decrease over time. I mean, from 1950s to now, it's one fifth of the, I mean, the current consumption is one fifth of the 1950s consumption. And actually they're both very close. When you go to the preserves of jams and fruit curds, I mean, again, you have that decrease in the, in, in the consumption, but, also, the, the series tend to converge at the end. I mean, by the early 1980s, the, the, the consumption of, uh, of, of preserves in Scotland actually looks very much the, the, like, like the average in, the, in Great Britain. I mean, the series in Scotland is, are far more jumpy because it's a much smaller uh, sample 
than when you consider the, 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 the full sample in, in Scotland. Uh, uh, marmalade, I mean, has sort of similar patterns as the, 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 as, as the previous one of the, the other preserves. Uh, the interesting things come when you go to cakes and pastries. If you remember the, uh, in the 1950s, there was a significant more uh, consumption in Scotland. However, late 1960s, there's a change there. And the, the, actually the average for, the, for Great Britain goes well above the Scottish average and only sort of late 1990s, early 2000s, both series match again. And, and the difference between the two sort of disappear. The, if you see the, the, the other of the culprits in, in, in the 1950s, which was buns, scones, and tea cakes, I mean, Scotland was well above in the 1950s over the, the average in, in Great Britain. However, the situation changes by the 19, early 1980s and by the remain part of the series, the, the Scottish series go well below the, the or, or below the average from, from Great Britain. Biscuits, well, biscuits, it, it, it's a mixed case. I mean, you can see biscuits well above the, in the 1950s. And, and then you have a mixed situation between the, the, the periods where, for instance, by, by the late 1990s, England goes, I mean, Great Britain goes, goes above uh, Scotland. And then the, the, uh, the average for, for in the last part of the series uh, favors uh, Scotland. Um, <laughs> Interestingly, that difference that was mentioned in the report of the 1950s, and that you, you can see it in the, I mean, in the literature on food, for instance, in the 19th century, uh, it's maintained over time. I mean, you, you can see that the average for Great Britain is, is above all over the average for, for Scotland. Which, which is very interesting. I mean, uh, it actually, it would be interesting to, to, to sort of follow up in terms of comparison of uh, baking, uh, whether this reflects uh, actually the, the less interest on in baking in Scotland than, than in the rest of uh, Great Britain. The other analysis that we did was one to to, to, to model the, the share of discretionary products. Um, and for this, we follow uh, an analysis done in 1987 by, by Cheshire and Reed, um, where they basically analyzed uh, the surveys for 1974, 79, 80, and 82. And here we follow much closer the, the model presented in 1991 by Cheshire and on the 50th anniversary of the National Food Survey. Uh, but we did this, this analysis for each one of the years from 1974 to till 2000, so it's just the, the period of the National Food Survey. And it's a period where, as, as you've seen, there's all these uh, uh, changes in, in, in patterns. And the, the, the model that you have there, it is so simple, 
it's uh, the share W1, W sub i is the share of sweet discretionary products in total foods. And then you have the share in the number of uh, children, male adults and female adults in the household. Fe is the total food expenditure and N is the total number of household members. Uh, and from there, you, you can get the response to, to that uh, share in discretionary products to changes in the total food uh, purchase. Um, these four panels give you, the, the first one give you the, the, the shares of the sweet discretionary in the total food expenditure. And you can, this, these are shares, not percentages. So basically you can see that actually for all the three countries, I mean, Scotland, England, and Wales, actually it represents less than, than 1%. And, uh, and, and you don't see really any trend in Scotland or England, but there's some sort of increasing trend in Wales. Um, then the, the other three panels, the proportion of children, household income elasticity, and low household members, are the coefficients from that model that I show you over time, I mean, for, for, for each one of them. Um, in terms of children, the greater the proportion of children, the greater the, the, the discretionary, sugar discretionary products. Uh, and that is for all the, the countries. Um, and I should mention that this, I mean, in all the, the for every year that we, oh, we run the model, I mean, all, all the parameters of the model were very, very significant. So, so uh, in terms of income elasticity, interestingly, you see that all the, all the parameters are negative, which means that the greater the, the income or the food expenditure in this case, the lower the, the 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 share of discretionary sweet product. Um, in terms of the members, the greater the the, the number of members in, in the in the household, the lower the, the share also has an, an impact, uh, a negative impact on the um, on that, and that's basically all that uh, I, think I, I mentioned all this in, 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 the, in the presentation. So just, I would like to make some, some final remarks, I mean, about the, the, these results that are some sort of a work in progress, I mean, the, I mean First, does Scotland live up to its reputation of a sweet tooth country? Or, I mean, or in other terms, there are some country cultural preference factors. I mean, that, that uh, are there. I mean, there are similarities between Great Britain and Scotland. I mean, the cases of sugar, and preserves, I mean, marmalade, I mean, you don't see much you also have this case that uh, the, on over time decrease on the purchases actually of all these discretionary products. There are, however, some, some differences. I mean, in the cases of jam and cord fruit, sweet biscuits show Scotland higher than, than Jamaica. There's a difference in the Scottish flour consumption which remains below all over the, the, the series um, over time. But probably the most interesting cases are, are those of purchases of buns, scones, and tea cakes, as well as cakes and pastries, where 
I mean, you have a significant decrease in terms of the situation of in 1950s. In terms of the, the sweet discretionary products in terms of uh, the share, well, they, they are actually less than 1% with wells slightly higher and with a trend. Um, income and family composition matter, matter and that's something that actually we are going to follow up with uh, an, another survey that complements the national food survey, which is a, the, the family expenditure survey, which actually is, is, is available uh, well before 1974. Uh, and I suppose I, sh I should mention that despite the progress made in terms of uh, in terms of consumption of these products, uh, which are is I mean the situation is encouraging. I mean it does not mean that the current diet is fine, but as it is still above the the nutritional requirements pointed out by experts. Let me just mention my, my acknowledgements. And uh, thanks very much for, 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 for listening. Uh, and now I'll stop sharing. Great, thank you so much, Cesar. That was really fascinating. I'm particularly struck by the variation in sweets consumption. I would have thought it would have been sort of, you know, the same across biscuits and cakes and pastries, but Clearly, clearly not. <laughs> no, no, I mean, and, and, and if you go to, to, to other food products, the, the difference are, are also striking. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, no, 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 it's, uh, yeah. it's a very interesting. Uh, yeah. that, that was really fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Um, so now um, we want to move on um, to um, sort of allowing you, the audience, to ask questions of um, the two speakers, if you will. Um, and I see that Anne Murcott would like to ask a question. Anne, are you there? Hi, Kelly. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you both speakers very much indeed for illuminating so much new material that was new to me, certainly. Um, uh, there's just one small point that I'd like to make about yours, Julia, uh, which is... Um, your final observations, which are very interesting, but you talked of long established foods as such as so as as helping balance the diet nutritionally. But that surely was not in the minds, you know, uh, of centuries ago of the people who were, um, you know, eating it. Uh, and isn't so I just wondered whether isn't that actually slightly an, an anachronistic interpretation? So that was one question to Julia. I don't know how you want to run it, Kelly. Do you want Julia to get a chance to answer then, or shall I go straight on to the questions for the other speaker? Which would you prefer? You're unmuted, Kelly. Sorry, I'm muted, thank you. Um, do you, how about we'll let um, Julia respond and then Anne, you can ask the other question if you like. Thank you. So, um, so in regards to your question about if people were thinking about nutritional balance, I mean, of course they aren't thinking about it in the same way um, that we are, right? But um, yeah, I, I think there is still merit in saying that people understood the benefits of say having proteins and vegetables and stuff, even if they weren't classified